Hello, welcome to Guyan Inue Browsers for the 6th of November 2019. Um, this week, this week on the agenda, uh, we will talk about awesome IPFS policy, uh, do a quick issue review for Brave V1, and then put a pin on co hosting. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Uh, Let's start with the first one. Awesome IPFS policy. So in the past week, weeks, we, we've been talking about IPFS slash awesome repo, which is also a website. Uh, maybe I will share it. So this is this website. And this website is backed by a GitHub repo. Uh, and that GitHub repo has always had a lot of pull requests open. And it's difficult to tell what's awesome and what's not without some kind of a policy. So I believe the idea was to um, sketch a policy of what things could be listed, list and listed on the awesome IPFS website and repo. Uh, not sure how we handle this. Uh, should we like just brainstorm for five minutes and then write some points or is there a better way to do that? Yeah, well maybe we should do spend a couple of minutes just walking through these initial comments here because some thought has been put into it so far. Um, I like Matt's initial idea or in Victor's initial idea of in using the code of conduct as a starting point. But beyond that, uh, I think there is like, um, beyond things that are concerning, I think there are things that just either we need to come up with a clear definition of, of what belongs or does not belong. So is something built on IPFS? Okay, maybe we should like start. Like that's is IPFS involved at all? Step one. <laughs> step, step one. Maybe uh, uh, should we like write this on the say, on the agenda as a note or? Yeah, let's do that. So looking at so Matt's comment is basically the uh, also copyright violations that's covered by code of conduct. Uh, also the harassment free stuff. Uh, we have a harassment friendly harassment free space um, so that also covered by the code of conduct so I feel like the, the code of conduct is, yeah. is, is for sure table stakes for being included uh, yeah. like any like any part of our anything in any of our repos is covered by that code so that's the easy yeah. one yeah then uh, it needs to use IPFS, like actually use IPFS or... Yeah. Yes, I think if a repo is named awesome IPFS, then it needs to use IPFS, not only like lip 2 p or IPLD or something. Right, all in favor? <laughs> also probably since it's an awesome thing, it should be used by more than X people, I don't know. Mm, hard to measure that though. Yeah, yeah. But. So maybe a better way to ask that question is, is there a reason why we want to turn any IPFS project away aside from whether it violates the code of conduct? Who would we say no to and why? Mm. I'd say uh, something, uh, that excludes people due to uh, financial reasons. So if it's a commercial product, it should have like a free tier. Mm -hmm. uh, but not sure if it's a proper way to frame it. But I feel if we publish something as awesome IPFS, it should, it, I, I don't think we should like reject uh, the project uh, that require pay, monthly payment if it's an opt-in. Uh, 
So I, I guess I'm wondering if, if there's a thing built on IPFS that I think is awesome and I'm totally excited to pay for. Yeah, that's a good question. Should we publish something? Let's say there's a audios and yeah. right. does it have like, at this point it's like free service, but uh, would it always be like this? Uh, would there be like a free tier such as like a Spotify has a free tier when you got like advertisements between songs? Uh, that's why I sort of sort of uh, come up with uh, this idea that there should be it should be possible to use a, a project or a service without paying. Why? I think like talking about that, we also have to take into account that it's not just services and apps that you're talking about. We have uh, six Libraries. categories. Yeah. yeah, we have apps, articles, data sets, services, tools, and videos. Yeah, so it's also like there, there could be a data sets which are behind paywall. Are those yeah. also? Mm. Um, mm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Yeah, so that's why I sort of like suggested this. Yeah. Even if it's like a five day trial. Yeah. yeah. Should, if right. we, yeah. If, if you go, yeah, so if you go to I'm the convinced. page, if you click on something, you should be able to yeah. evaluate this. And you evaluate it uh, w without paying, right? I, I like maybe we describe that as immediately usable and op by everyone. So something like you can, you can, you can, you don't have to. It is not because I, I agree. I don't think we want anything that's entirely paywalled. Yeah. yeah. I, I like the idea. I don't want to ban somebody who has a paid service because we want people to actually make a living, pay their rent, and buy clothes and food by working with MPFS. That's the end goal, so we can all do those things, right? But um, I like the idea that you, we only want to publish things here that are immediately usable by everyone. Um, Just a suggestion. Why don't you go over each category and see the reasons why we would not accept yeah. something for each category? For example, the videos. Why wouldn't we accept All right, so for video? Uh, uh, all right, so let's go with videos. <laughs> yeah, I think it's simpler okay. to exclude videos than apps. I don't know. Yeah, let's say some streaming service uh, is using IPFS. Um, yeah. Would it be okay to put it here? It, what On the video section. Sorry. Oh, right, that, then that would be like in services. Uh, the videos, yeah. yeah, videos should be. Oh man, oh, man. we quickly go into the weeds of like uh, having license for redistribution with <laughs> within the uh, awesome IPFS. Uh, no, we just link, right? There's no player. Just yeah, yeah, there's no player. Like, right now we only have five videos, but there's nothing uh, against adding like all the IPFS camp videos, for example, which yeah. I, I believe, be great. Yeah, I believe well, it. But what, why wouldn't it be great though? And I think that's the yeah. question. Like, is there a volume amount? Are we trying to restrict to a certain set of things, like limit 20 things in each category? Or like if we're not limiting. And why is videos even a category? <laughs> I think it makes sense as a category if you want to find new videos. Yeah. Uh, uh, video is the video is the number one of all media distribution. It's the number yeah. one engagement channel for developers. Uh, like you can you can get your your message out, your tutorial scene, and your workshop scene, and your materials learned about with video. Uh, so much more than any amount of articles or any amount of other type of community engagement. The, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. People love watching video. <laughs> I, I don't really do that. I like reading code, but uh, <laughs> a lot of people really like video. So I, I really like that we have video there. I, I think like uh, this point about being immediately useful to people uh, applies to videos. Um, so you click on the link, you can watch the video. Uh, the other thing is that about the content itself. Uh, we don't want, probably we don't want to uh, have 
dozens of introduction to IPFS uh, videos, which are sort of like all the same. Yeah. It probably should be something that adds value on top of other things that are already on the website. But it's highly subjective. How do you evaluate that? It's like a dead po point on the policy. So again, I want to flip the, flip the question a bit because I feel like it'll be too hard to write a policy if we, if we don't have an understanding of the broader constraint. So there seems to be a concern about having too much of something, too many of something, uh, too many of the same thing. So then we have to, because we can't really just, we can't make those other decisions about what meets, like how, if you have 20 introduction to IPFS videos, which, well, what if the one we have up there is the worst one? And then one of the ones we didn't accept is way better. Yep. So I, I guess from where I sit, I would rather make sure that we just get everything in here. If it meets that basic criteria, it's about IPFS. And then later we can add things that like either, you know, Reddit style voting that flips stuff up to the top or provides a sorting order based on how often it's viewed, things like that. Like some, or how many people starred it or something like that. Like later we can add ways to maybe highlight the best of awesome, the most awesome of awesome IPFS. But I, I feel like it, unless we come up with something really clear, like we only have 20 of each in each category or something like that, then it's going to be really hard to, all, we're going to have to always be reevaluating and always kind of redeciding these things. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure about like limiting because <laughs> then it's like every new thing you want to add will require you to drop something <laughs> and that's like reverse. Hey, Right, exactly. So that's why, like, you can only you can go one of two ways there, right? Like, you're just yeah. like, okay, let's put let as much stuff be found here as possible, get indexed by search engine, and all this stuff, uh, which will be some also some sort of prioritization and sorting function on its own. It's just external on the website, um, but or we do something like that where we have a system for how we limit what's there, or evaluate what is the best introduction to IPFS, or we rotate, right, like. Yep. Like for every, for every new one that comes in, in the data sets category, we pop one off the bottom, take it out. I think that, yeah, there was a proposal to randomize it, I think. So yeah, I think they are already yeah. randomly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Aren't they? oh yeah. 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 But it seems like the, the, the questions that we have around, why would we say no to something aside from code of conduct? Well, we already have a bunch. Uh, it's it's uh, not as good as the other ones we already have. Yeah, so it needs to be like uh, not noticeably unique. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, it's like oh. <laughs> See, that's why I'm like it's it's much easier if we just say just yep. add everything, make it be like the canonical source of all the IPFS things, and then we can layer on ways to narrow down access to the best bits. Yeah, yeah. I think like right now, it's if if you look at like maybe uh, apps, every time you load it, uh, you get a, a different board. Basically, the more you have, the different it is. Yeah, almost uh, makes it so you this, so you can't find something that you saw before ever again. Yeah, <laughs> but but it's also like a, a this river like uh, website when you just go and get something new every time. Um, yeah. Sh like, uh, is there, because we, right now we got like respect code of conduct, needs to use IPFS and needs to be- No, no paywall. Yeah, immediately usable. Uh, are we missing something crucial here? Uh, should it like, because like things like, uh, respecting copyright all the attribution is all under like code of conduct so that's like huge surface covered there yeah uh, i'm a is, is privacy covered by the kind of the code of conduct okay good question like apps privacy and data 
yeah, how is the data used if I use this IPFS based app? Hmm. Yeah, it's, I think that that's a reasonable. So having this apart from the code of conduct, like uh, needs to come with clear privacy policy. Would that be useful? Because that if it's a video, then the video is on a, some service and that service comes with privacy policy. Yeah, but I mean, a, at that point, like ban YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a that's a fair point. Like, that's a trade off that 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 we need to let the. I feel like that's a trade off we need to let the end user make, and it also means that it's on it's on us as the curators of us might be best to then look at the privacy policies, evaluate the surveillance and data collection practices of every single link that comes in, and that's just not not reasonable. Like the benefit that we're going to get from that is going to be really low. And okay, then so all three of us would be auditing other people's code bases. So, so I, I propose instead of like auditing privacy policies, just require to for a privacy policy to exist. So the people can always uh, evaluate on, on their own. Uh, if it's an app or a service, okay. that service should provide a link to a privacy policy. Uh, and Maybe you could put that in the issue template too, so that people yeah. have to yeah. post it. Um, uh, but not all categories of things might have privacy policy, like downloaded data set won't have a privacy policy. Uh, use this library if you want, where you have the full and complete code. Comes with, uh, with uh, like clear. I like that too, yeah, license. Because yeah. it's like sort of like, if it's a data set or, or some article, then it's like a license under something. Uh, could be Creative Commons Zero uh, or like requiring common Creative Commons Zero uh, defaulting to that unless it's something else. Uh, and if it's a service, then there's our app, there, then there's a privacy policy, right? Uh, that's more or less should cover. Yeah, sounds good. Those. Another thing which might be more difficult to, to be careful of is the, if it's up to date, for example, we have a tool called IPFS GUI, which is supposed to be a simple Windows UI providing IPFS integration, which has not been updated since 2017. Okay, so I think we could, uh tweak this needs to use uh, <laughs> latest <laughs> today. Well, here's the thing though. If somebody wants to make a new Windows based IPFS GUI, they would find that and maybe fork it, make changes to it. They might start participating. Yeah. They might revive the project. So I don't want to say remove stuff just because it's old. Like the okay. best IPFS explainer might be old. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if that's the right trade-off there. I, I think the sorting, sorting and ordering might help there a little bit. Like if we change from random to sort by newest always. So you always, everybody who comes sees fresh content. Yeah. Uh, might be a way to, then that, that old one will get pushed way down below the fold, you know, like yeah. page 32 is the content. X. Yeah, or Actually, or we could like tweak the, this randomization to sort of be a tiered, like randomize newest stuff for the past like six months or a year, and then randomize everything older than that. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a sort of like a separate, separate discussion. Uh, uh, we got four points and I, I'm not sure. Um, I think that there should be a point about if uh, additional information was required. So you submit a PR to the repo, right? And you are, and you forgot to link to license or a privacy policy or something, and someone making re PR review asked you for that. Uh, we should be able to simply close the PR without merging if we don't get response within, uh, I don't know, like a few weeks. Yeah, I agree with that. 
Now, how to frame that in one short sentence? <laughs> well, in that case, it, it never gets added, right? So I feel like that's a little bit different. Yeah, but uh, I think that it's a part, basically if, if the license is missing, it's breaking the last point. So yeah, it's yeah, on yeah. the list. Yeah. I think that's a pretty solid list. Yeah, I mean, we, we still haven't solved the, we kind of do have an open concern about too many of X, too many of Y, uh, but I, I feel like that's a low priority concern compared to the rest of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think and that's- we can, we can fix that in a whole bunch of different other ways if we want. Yeah, I think we have a bot which checks if links are still valid and we like remove that uh, like links that no longer resolve. Uh, so we already have like a, cleanup process in place, oh, we, that's could awesome. we could always remove, uh, uh, like extend it to periodically checking projects because the, the domain may still work, but a different thing may be behind that domain. Uh, that's, uh, that's a separate, separate problem space. Are we happy with this list or do we want to spend more time on it? Looks good to me. I think it's fine. I feel like it's the right balance of how much time we want to put yep. into running Awesome IPFS um, and having some a clear guidance on what's allowed and what's not. All right. Uh, I think the action item here is... Because uh... later we can then say, say we do end up with 258 introduction to IPFS videos and we're like, okay, that's a good problem. <laughs> <laughs> let's figure out, then let's figure out how to, you know, sort them by what people like or what were effective or something like that. But that we can solve that later down the road. All right. Uh, cool. Uh, so we will PR uh, private uh, poly, policy to the repo with those points um, and we'll like refine them later. Um, should we move to the next one? Brave do one issue review. Yeah. One one quick thing. Can you uh, request review on that policy from um, what's his name? The there's an, a nice fellow from your continent <laughs> that also reviews some of the PRs now and then. He pops in. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 yes. Please ask all of Europe to review. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't remember if he was French living in Germany or Austrian living in Belgium mm -hmm. or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll was, probably, I'd probably was, uh, find okay. a nice, yeah, nice person in the repo from Europe. <laughs> <laughs> but he was reviewing a bunch of these PRs. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, I think I know who he is. Mm -hmm. Uh, it sounds like a plan. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, Brave V1 issue review. Uh, pa -pa -pa uh, should we like look at the project or? Then yeah, we I think can, yeah, if we, we can, can walk through the set of issues that we say, okay, this is the diff. Yes, Kuala Lorenzo. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. If we could say like, these are the definitive set of issues that we absolutely must fix and then draw a line in sand and call it V1. Because we have a lot of options here. Uh, I was super scared that I forgot the press record button, so I could check. <laughs> but I'm recording. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, let's go with like in order. Because uh, uh, in progress, this is a meta issue, which I sort of like started splitting stuff out of it because it grew too big and you can scroll and scroll and see all related issues in other repos. So I use like a, like a junction point to see rela work related uh, to Brave, uh, but that is mostly like a placeholder because I'm not able to like CC uh, this, this board. Um, so the first one on the to-do list is uh, local discovery. Uh, story behind local discovery is that right now we are able to discover Go IPFS, uh, but in a local network um, using MDNS.
However, if you got two Brave browsers, those browsers are not able to announce themselves using MDNS. Uh, and instead, they discover each other using uh, centralized WebSocket star signaling server. So they discover each other using that signaling server and they exchange local IPs and then they connect directly. So the, central, the centralized signaling server is only used for this initial discovery. That, then there's a peer-to-peer -peer -peer connection uh, between them. Uh, so a fix here would be to see if we are able to uh, reuse this uh, UDP port 5353, which is part of the spec. If not, uh, write a custom uh, discovery or using different port that's specific to Brave. Um, that's more or less the background on this issue. So th this seems like it, this is functionality that would kind of be aligned with uh, beyond regular gateway usage. So I feel like this is something that we could push to V2. Yep. Uh, should we like mark this somehow, uh, like a priority or? Yeah, or a label. I think a, a label for um, the V2, phase two, something like that. Or, or maybe. maybe, maybe I should like, should I like, name this Brave V1 and make a separate project for Brave V2? Would that be easier? That, that, sounds, that sounds good. It makes it harder to be able to, to view just for all V2 issues though. So I'm, I'm kind of in favor of doing a label no matter what. And, and then, then yeah, if you want to use a project board later, that's fine also. Let's do Brave uh, V2 for now, we can always. I was going to suggest instead of creating a new project, uh, create a new column. Oh, that's a. Yeah, that's nice to see it like, all in one go. That's actually, yeah. Uh, to do V2. That's pretty cool. Um, oh yeah, actually, <laughs> let's make this V2. Yeah, that's really nice because then we can see the clear, yeah, clear so distinction that, between. That, yeah, and then the, if I like add it to this project, it will automatically land in V2. Because it's a board with some sort of like automation. Uh, all right, so this is v, V2, then uh, welcome screen should uh, suggest embedded node as an option. Uh, so that's... This is like, definitely V2, right? Yeah, that's an open question, because if we ship... Um, right now we ship... Uh, when someone installs IPFS Companion, uh, they are asked to install IPFS Desktop or go IPFS on this welcome screen. The question is, that remains true for V1, and we could uh, change that in V2. However, we could also, in V1, add this less prominent option to try embedded JS APFS. Uh, should, could that be V1? I think this is a could be V1. Doesn't have to must be V1. Right, so nice, like a nice to have. I think we do want to encourage people to try the embedded node. We have a lot of opportunities to do that. Um, let's, yeah, let's make it very, very low and for now. Yeah, sounds great. Um, all right. Um, Brave and web UI missing values in latency column. Uh, that's sort of a pro open problem still. Uh, I, I hope to. Let me find it. Uh, yeah, I was hoping it's uh, maybe I'll show it. It's maybe Brave Night. All right, so I go and enable companion. Right, and I switch to embedded node. 
Ready? Why it's not working? <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> If I stop sharing, it will start working. Let me. <laughs> I can't believe it. I have no idea why. That's a separate. That's a separate. Okay, because that's nightly. It may not be a problem. Let me check. Uh, let me check in a regular one. That's what you get for using nightly for demo. Okay. Let me share my screen again. All right. Uh, settings and compiler. Okay. So my local node uh, is offline. There's no IPFS desktop. I switch to, yeah, that was uh, nightly. Um, I switch to embedded node. Take some time to start, uh, but eventually it will start. Yep, and I got some peers. Um, okay, so if I open web UI. Um, Those are some fascinating black blocks of unrendered content. Oh man, that preload really speed things up. <laughs> uh, cause that's because I just like immediately opened it. Okay. Yes, laptop. So this value- For anyone just... watching this, uh, it's fast on regular laptops. It's just my laptop. <laughs> so th this value is, is the latency uh, of a given peer? Because I'm both recording and, uh, and also running both browsers. And I will run out of memory soon. All right. So uh, on the peer screen, you can see the latency is empty. Uh, another thing, uh, no idea what this is happening on the bandwidth graph. And what's interesting, this bug with Canvas happens also if you are using regular uh, web UI in Brave for some reason. Uh, the empty latency column is only on the embedded node. Uh, let me move that to a separate screen. But basically, it's a uh, a cosmetic issue like this and and the other one are cosmetic issues uh, would probably it, it does not like break uh web ui uh, screen it's just like a missing latency column it, this also seems then uh, like a, a nice you, are you muted or it's just me not not hearing you at all Because I just realized I'm, I'm you are, in, you like are moving, in, uh, but I cannot hear you. Enrique, can you say something? Hello. Oh gosh, it's me. Sorry, guys. One second. Ak, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. We, we could hear you the whole time, but I think maybe you couldn't hear us. Uh, about now. Are you using the Huawei laptop? Maybe that is the problem. Uh, this uh, video stream is non-sponsored by Huawei. <laughs> uh, so sorry about that. Uh, for some reason, my audio just got muted. 
Uh, can you hear? I, I, yeah, I can hear right. now. I, I, I understand you were commenting behind the scenes for a long time and I was not able to hear you. <laughs> uh, um, this seems like a nice to have, not a blocker for V1. Right, let's mark it like. Now the other issue where the bandwidth page also shows nothing on the canvas, that seems like it might actually be a blocker for V1. If, if with a non-embedded node, we usually show that data, then it seems like we should figure out what's causing that to be shown. Mm. Oh yeah, I believe I created an issue for, for that uh, graph in web UI repo instead. Uh, um, but I should be able to add a card with this. So, um. yeah, I, I also have a recommendation. I say we give ourselves 10 minutes to speed through the rest of these issues. Oh, yeah, yeah, because it's like taking uh, turbo triage. Turbo triage. Oh, I think you are familiar enough with most of these issues too that you could probably make a determination fairly quickly. Oh, yeah. Like switching web UI to window.ipfs, probably not a blocker. Not a blocker at all. Um, request throttling block action button update. Uh, that's V1 uh, for sure, because uh, it's like the UI does not work. It's probably okay. optimization in the way we initialize things. Uh, evaluate the alternative data store, that's V2. Too, yeah. the, the current one works also. We are waiting for uh, performance fixes uh, by Hugo. Preload of pre-cached web UI triggers throttling at preload nodes. Uh, that's V1, and that's mostly like me either throttling it on the extension end or talking with uh, Oli and the gateway Bifrost team uh, to make those limits, throttling limits higher. If it mm. comes from companion or, or something, uh, then uh, web UI shows invalid MFS. Oh, wait, size. wait, wait, hold on, back yeah. up. So that last one, that happens no matter what, right? Like that has nothing to do necessarily with Brave. Um, it happens if you are using uh, embedded JS APFS. So then it definitely is V2. I think but anything with, em with embedded node, is any optimization for embedded node is V2. And the whole point of calling this V1 is now between the release of V1, which is embedded node is experimental, it's not expected to work, and V2 is we can figure out what doesn't work oh. and fix it. Okay, so if we are moving things that happen only if you are using embedded node. Yeah, yeah. Then also like all this stuff. Oh, is that also, I thought, so that's why I was asking about the, the, the bandwidth screen. I was like, oh, if it. Uh, yeah, so actually only bandwidth is okay. a problem in uh, both uh, external and embedded. Ah, okay, then yeah, like I feel like anything that is directly a side effect of running embedded node is not a have to fix for everyone at all. It should be in V2. Okay. Like uh, let's, let's identify the minimum set of issues that we can, that, the ones that we absolutely have to fix to be able to say that regular IPFS node not embedded running in Brave. Oh yeah. Oh, in that true. case, that's a super, super easy lens uh, to pass through. Uh, that's done because okay. <laughs> uh, the things in v1 are things that uh, happen or needs to be answered no matter if you are using external or embedded node right so right. mostly we care about this initial experience someone is going to settings like yeah. I, I did uh, twice today and enable <laughs> uh, companion and you get this in, it, it, default experience when we ask you to install a pfs desk so in that case, we need to have uh, the status page working fine with a embedded uh, with external uh, Go IPFS. Um, we could suggest this option, and we also need to fix uh, MFS size. Uh, however, this is not like specific to Brave at all. It's yeah. a generic bug in Web UI. Uh, so that's yeah. probably. I feel like that that's not a blocker either. We, we probably. I'm not even sure if it should be under Brave because I yeah. found it when I was working on Brave. Um, that's mostly like related to co-hosting. <laughs> yeah, there's a, 
and, and that's one of a number of reasons that can cause those things to be out of sync, right? Like across the topology of running desktop and running an embedded node and running web UI, mm -hmm. there's multiple reasons why the numbers there might not reflect what you've actually added to a repo, what you haven't. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's the problem. Uh, the problem with this lens is that actually all the problems happen with embedded node. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So the, the, only, uh, the only question is, uh, should we suggest embedded node? I think uh, we, we could. I, yeah, I, I really like that. I don't think it's a blocker for it, but I think it would be a really nice uh, in, to introduce, like, we've gotten this far. The extension is semi-pre-installed. Uh, we have some nice feet, and then we have an additional set of superpowers that we have in Brave that are experimental for trying. Yep. But are not production ready. Yeah. Yeah. And also, uh, that's a part of uh, re like improving this welcome screen. Right now, we, we got add, recently added a button to just open Web UI. If you got everything installed, uh, the idea was to add like separate buttons for like files and other things to make this initial experience more useful for people to, because people install IPFS uh, companion. Uh, that's a going, me going on a tangent a little bit and started looking at those like on uninstalled feedback. And often people were not sure what to do or like it was not uh, what people expected. To and if on the welcome screen, we provide some options that may uh, make it easier for people to discover what's what. Uh, I think that's it because like uh, V1 is basically the, the UX polish and and the rest is uh, iterating on the meta node uh, is pushed to v2. Excellent. That sounds great. That means maybe we can uh, put these posts together by the end of lab week and maybe publish early December. Because uh, otherwise, um, due to other releases like GoIPFS and Filecoin related stuff, and then holidays, we would want to wait and do a blog post in January. Um, yay, thanks for adding that one too. That is a requirement. Um, so that I think this, this makes our, 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 our pathway un, uncluttered very clear to be able to do that. Yep. And doing that in this early, if we can do it in early December, I think we yep. talked about yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Works. So, so we can sound, work on that. Sounds pretty good. And the, the V2 stuff, uh, it, it will happen like in the background anyway. Uh, those are things. Some of those things are not like Brave specific, but it's like Brave is uh, forcing function to address them sooner than later. Yeah. And, and what we should do as well as, as maybe at a future meeting, roadmap out the, where we, when we want to do V2, like yeah, what our embedded node goal is for 2020. Oh yeah, because those are sort of like a leftovers. Uh, yeah. from v1 uh v2 will have much more yeah um, like native native stuff uh, hints on the browser level uh, things that we've like discussed internally with Brave. Uh, all right i, I guess cool. that's done cool uh to, to, to the remaining topic is co-hosting co-hosting so co-hosting <laughs> super excited so much stuff to do <laughs> but the but the proposal we're thinking about one of the themes for 2020 being Wikipedia and these type of flows. And what I wanted to suggest was to actually stop work on co-hosting for now until the end of the year, so that we can focus on getting the test stuff up and running before the end of the year, which is a the priority for the quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, so to that that was what I wanted to propose. Uh, I, I kind of agree. Uh, I, I mean, uh, we should finalize those open PRs. I think, honestly, we the only rem like remaining thing uh, we have this command line tool installable from npm, which is IPFS co-host. And there's like a, I, I believe uh, how can you open the PR to sw to s make this full snapshotting by default, right? Uh, I haven't, but there's the the issue. I'm just waiting to know what's the threshold. Stress threshold something like that uh, oh threshold, uh, yeah yeah threshold yeah for the the for ask or to ask the confirmation 
because I suggested 100 megabytes, which is huge. And then uh, I noted that IPFS IO website is 10 megabytes and the blog is for 40 megabytes. And Alan wasn't expecting that. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting uh, conversation because yeah, uh, turns out the repo uh, with the website has a lot of like super old examples, which we, yeah. I don't think we no longer link to, but we still publish them with each version. Uh, yeah, it's IPFS, so it's deduplicated across all versions, but still. Um, uh, yeah, so long story short, I think uh, we we probably could, could should, could, should uh, add this threshold, so we warn users before they pin super big thing, because people will, uh, the first thing people will do, will try to like co-host Wikipedia, and we should at least warn them, hey, it's 650 gigs, so we would like, you know, uh, check the size of entire tree uh, and uh, display this warning. But I feel when it comes to co time we invest in co-hosting this quarter, that would be like the last task. Uh, the integration of like IPFS co-host as a library, like both making sure it's a small bundle library and also then integrating that bundle with IPFS companion UI uh, and IPFS desktop for like updating in background, I feel that's something that needs to happen like in Q1 or later. Um, yeah, it, it was actually the, the threshold conversation that kind of made me start thinking about this because I was like, okay, there, there are, I, I feel like we're gonna start making decisions about what the users who might be doing co-hosting want without their input, without like, I feel like that was a whole discussion Yep. The default, whether the default should be lazy or not, was a discussion about the decisions that actually the users of co-hosting need to make about how they want it to behave and where it's integrated in their system. And I want to be able to have that conversation in a broader way with the input of the people that actually want to do that archiving. Like a little bit of user research and a few interviews of people who are like, if I was going to have my browser open and I happen to have the IPFS desktop running and I have companion installed and I'm at a website and I'm like, I want to click a button and say, I want this website to be available for everyone. At that point, they need to be able to make those types of decisions around what hardware capacity they have available, how much bandwidth they want to be able to share and use. And we can hang out and talk in circles to make those decisions for them without their input and without doing that research. And there's no guarantee we're going to be right. And even if we do the research, there's no guarantee we're going to be right. But I want to be able to have a more informed decision-making process around how we actually roll this out in a way that makes it available. Like we have a, I think the potential here is for some of the high-level dreams of IPFS to really be true for end users in an easily accessible way. And I want as many people as possible to be able to take advantage of that. And I think if we're just doing that in, in repos where... It's, you know, the three of us and, and maybe Alan or maybe one other person talking about in the context of a CLI, it's not the right, we're not going to have the, the best ability or visibility when we make those decisions. So that's why I was like, I really want us to be able to think about this in a more product oriented way so that we can get it into the hands of millions of people. And I think it's going to be hard to do that with lab week or testing stuff that we need to do. And then the holidays. But it does fit in really well into a 2020 where we're focused for the whole year in a theme that might be oriented around exactly this type of exposure of IPFS. Totally. Uh, and just to clarify, this uh, discussion about threshold was specific to this common line tool, which the, the, I, I believe like the key purpose of this common line tool is to ship a basic implementation of co-hosting spec just so people can play with it. Uh, and it works everywhere, uh, unlike like the bash script. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the only, uh, yeah, but it, I feel yeah. At, the, at the same time, like e e even the people that are running the CLI, you know, we're kind of making that decision. We could have just said there's no default, right? That's another one. There is no default. It's like the person has to specify which the one they actually want. Right. another option. So I feel like just, there's time put into something where we, we don't actually need a decision yet anyway. Uh, yeah, so like I, I agree, we probably should have put a pin on 
any new stuff related to co-hosting, especially like uh, this library uh, integration to companion and desktop. Um, I'd still like to ship a safer version of this command line tool. I, I like I fully understand the risk, uh, the the concern of like making arbitrary decisions. Like we can, uh, like we can always change it. Uh, the problem is like if someone likes uh, like enters IPFS co-host add Wikipedia, uh, that's really uh, problematic. If because yeah. uh, we the, the problem is. Uh, we don't have APIs for tracking progress of fetching such huge data set. It's 650 gigabytes and basically the command hangs until you got everything on your disk. Uh, that's why I want at least some uh, helpful hands to user, hey, it's 650 gigs. Are but you wasn't, sure? the, wasn't the default lazy before and then that wouldn't have happened? Yeah, this is still uh, default. It's, it's still it's default, so we, we can just like put a pin on it. That's the pause, yeah. the pause button. The pause button, yeah. Is, is there any issues? There's probably, I, there's always issues. There are already issues tracking things like uh, uh, upload and download status, the way that you're describing file transfer status. Uh, but are those anywhere near a reality? having some ability to see what happened. Like IPFS add a 650 gig directory or file. Uh, so like if you add data to IPFS, there's uh, the tracking progress. We got API for that. I don't think we have API for tracking fetch from IPFS itself. So if I want to fetch that CID, which is like 600 gigabytes, I have no good way to tell at what's the percentage of that on my local node. I'm not able to tell how much it will take given the current speed. Uh, and, and that's why we sort of like created co-hosting uh, to surface those problems, right? We, those are the very good uh, problems to have when you start playing with, uh, with GUI, you see, oh, we actually don't have API for tracking that. Um, and that's something we will need to tackle before we integrate it to Companion or IPFS desktop in some way. Because like if we do the lazy thing, then we know we don't need to track progress. But the moment we give people option to pin entire thing, then we need those APIs. Um, so that will probably happen in stages, even in, in like 2020, it will still happen in stages because we need those APIs to land in like Go and other places. All right. Uh, that it is, it is amazing how, how powerful it is building actual GUIs and surfacing how engineering oriented the project is so far. Uh, I mean, it is a protocol, so that is not really surprising. But in terms of understanding what the needs of those protocol, that protocol is in order to, what, the, what, what we need from that protocol in order to do basic things like user communication, um, that's, that's without a doubt the, one of the most powerful parts of these types of projects. Spending a year on developing co-hosting into a very mature product flow, I think would would be a, would result in, in likely nothing but very good things for the core protocol. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm not, like we are not married to this specific version of co-hosting, uh, MFS based It's a, it's a convention. It's a, really. it's, yeah. yeah, it's a convention to start conversation going. And I, I believe like, like, like the key uh, thing that we should like focus on is this interaction when you are on, a website like Wikipedia and you make that decision. Uh, all like the technical de uh, decisions and uh, uh, which APIs are used or added uh, should come from that moment when user wants to help Wikipedia, but they may have limited space or they may not fully understand how IPFS and distributed networks work and they just want- I, I want don't to even know that. I, they should be able to like, oh, I should be, I want to help to the degree my local machine uh, lets me to, like, right? Um, and those are 
very interesting uh, questions from from like the UX experience, all the technical aspects uh, uh, problems we have for our developers, which I'm and pretty ha pretty happy with uh, how Cohost is going so far. Because yeah, me too. Yeah. I, th I think that's part of the challenge is that it is exciting. We're like, ah, oh, there's a lot of potential here and it would be super fun to be able to build this. And we'd be able to see kind of like how, how uh, what the adoption would, would look like pretty early and easily. And that's a, that's a pretty powerful, powerful story. But I, I want us to be able to do it. We need, I feel like we need to get, we need to get the testing stuff out of the way first because that's the priority for, for this quarter yep. and make sure that we at least have some like basic end to end tests in Azure before uh, before going on and tackling uh, these other bigger projects. Yep. All right. Are we at the end of the agenda? Yes, we are. All right. Who who is going to submit the PR for the or the issue? Yeah, the PR for the policy to start that conversation. Oh, now that it's super easy, <laughs> then maybe maybe you want to volunteer. <laughs> We, we, we did the hard part. We had the conversation. Um, what, what I was thinking is maybe I just post, I'm going to paste this in that issue because there's already an issue there for discussion and let the people that are there comment on this proposal for an initial criteria. And that would be a good start. And then once we get some agreement there, submit a PR. Um, so I kind of go back and forth on like submitting a PR. PRs have momentum. Yeah. So then once there's that PR there, it seems like a little bit less of a discussion. It's like a way to totally own the conversation without, it's a, it's a little bit, it's like an aggro conversation starter. There's already an issue in a conversation. So I'll just put, paste it in there. And look at okay. there. Yeah. If nobody says anything, great. Oh, it's, a very, meant, it's a very permissive policy. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm like, I had the brain, brain fart. I meant uh, uh, notes for this meeting. Ah, yes, <laughs> click. <laughs> Nice. I need to convert all of our, there's like a bunch of other meetings I need to convert to use that now. Yeah. It should, I think it should be easier because now you will like remove paths. I had to like add qu quarter calculation uh, to Volker's, Volker notes. But <laughs> now, now, yeah, yeah. There was a bug, but I fixed it. Now quarters are correct to calculate. Um, now I just want to, I was going to add a PR that allowed you to to have that tool read inputs from the URL bar so that then you can actually use it like an API and make bookmarklets and add-ons. Ah, uh, yeah. So just add those parameters to the URL and then the form will autofill. You can just unclick. Yep. Pretty useful, I must say. Uh, all right, guys, I uh, will be stopping recording soon, so let's wave. And see, and see everyone next week. <laughs>